as I was mentioning before you all, uh, before many of you arrived, um, it, it feels as though we're all coming back home um, and we're feeling this a bit of a return to normality. Um, so really, thank, first of all, thank you all for being here and being part of the community. And then a special thanks to, to a few people. First of all, Michael Rose. And I met Michael a, year, a few years ago when I did a, a drive-by to the Providence Arts Club and he was gracious and brought me around their beautiful, beautiful clubhouse, clubhouses, club block, um, club core of, Providen of downtown Providence. Mm -hmm. um, and also to Martin Murray, who has been doing so many of these parts and has really just been leading some of this outreach on who we are and how we do things. And of course, Sasha Sinclair for supporting this program. We can't do it without her. And, and, and again, all of you as, as being participants. Um, and while this may feel like it's the first collaboration with the Providence Arts Club, and quite frankly, it is the first collaboration in many decades, it isn't. Um, one of the roots of the Arts Club of Washington is found in the soil of Providence and then within the doors of the, the Providence Arts Club. I mean, in those early days of, of our club, um, as we were first getting together, we really did have two separate groups. We had the first group, which was fashioning itself as the Arts Club of Washington, which combined both male and female members. Um, and then, and those were really led by the people that we remember, Bertha Noyes and Luther Morris Leisinger. And, and they were putting together that committee. Um, Bertha, was there and went up to the Providence Arts Club, was hosted by them, and she realized what the possibility of this club could be. Um, there was the other group, um, and that other group ended up meeting in the studio of Henry Bush Brown, combined the efforts and created what is today the Arts Club of Washington. But that whole inspiration for who we are and some of that DNA came from the group that Michael um, helps lead. So Michael, it's you and so, and gosh, Again, on behalf of the whole club, thank you all so much um, for, for doing this. And I'm gonna go off camera because you don't wanna see me. <laughs> so thank you all for having me here tonight. I really appreciate um, the camaraderie between our two clubs. This is so exciting. Um, uh, like Henry was saying, we met some time ago when Henry was up in Providence. And um, I don't know if this had been on my mind at all, but I, not that long ago, I was sort of thinking and, and remembering the great conversation I had with Henry about the Arts Club of Washington and thought maybe now was a good time for us to try to um, do some programming together. And, and I, we, I was talking to Henry and Sasha earlier and Martin earlier um, that hopefully this will be the first of many collaborations between all the different reciprocal arts clubs that we have um, between DC and Chicago and Boston and Providence and all, of the, all the places in between. And I'm sure that the Arts Club of Washington will keep you all in the loop about upcoming programs that might come out of this. Um, so I'm Michael, I'm the gallery manager at the Providence Art Club. This is a photo of our club. Um, it's not just one building, it's a collection of four buildings on what we call College Hill here in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, you can see it's very picturesque. Whenever you uh, see an article in like travel, travel and Leisure about Providence, they always use a picture of the Providence Art Club because it's just so lovely, it's so beautiful. Um, and across these four buildings, we have our, we have a cafe. Um, we have three unique gallery spaces. Um, we're home to about 15 individual artist studios. Um, we also have a studio classroom and we have a print studio. Um, and we have an art collection of about 600 items. Uh, and it's, just, it's, and it's a remarkable place. I mean, you can, you can travel all over the country and really not find anything quite like the Providence Art Club. It's a unique organization. And I have to say that when, um, Martin and Henry were sending me the description of the program that Martin's going to do for the Providence Art Club, the, the line about how our club inspired your club really, I mean, I had the chills hearing that, you know, it's interesting to think of, you know, we are part of a continuum of art history here. Um, in this image on the, on the sort of far left of this image you see, uh, or on the far right of this image rather, there's a, a little brick building at the top of the hill. That's our clubhouse, um, very iconic green front door there. And through there, you'll find our main gallery, um, our, the main part of our uh, cafe, 
um, and and all of these buildings are sort of tied together. Uh, the second building on the hill that has a sort of lovely um, Dickensian storefront on the first floor, that houses another one of our galleries. It also houses our library, our administrative offices. Um, the third house on the hill, uh, the bright yellow house, we call the Deacon Taylor House. That has 10 artist studios in it. It also houses most of our art collection. Um, and then the fourth building on the street is called the Fleur de Lis Studio Building, uh, which is a National Historic Landmark. If any of you are familiar with the, the writing of H.P. Lovecraft, he included that house or studio building in one of his um, short stories. Um, and it's on the National Register of Historic Places for its contributions to the genesis of the arts and crafts movement in the United States. Um, we've been located in the brick building since 1885. So just five years after we were founded, we moved in to that building. And I'll take you inside a couple of these spaces. Um, so the, the Providence Art Club was founded in 1880. Um, we had 16 founders, 10 were men and six were women. As far as we know, um, we are the first club of our kind to be co-founded by men and women in which women were really included as full and equal members from that very first uh, moment. Um, the, the reason for the club was very simple. They wanted to promote art culture in the city of Providence and beyond. If you dive into it a little deeper, um, some of the sort of contemporaneous accounts of why they were starting this organization uh, state that they were sort of fed up with art dealers. They wanted to have a gallery of their own. You know, they, uh, they realized that Providence had the capacity to have a great art culture and they didn't see it being acted on by people. So they wanted to do that. Um, and they wanted to bring together not just visual artists, um, but they wanted to bring together artists. They realized that in order to sell art, you needed to have collectors and patrons of the art be part of the organization. They wanted it to be partially an educational organization. So they wanted to bring in amateurs. Uh, and then they wanted to have people from different um, professions that are affiliated with the arts, like architecture. Um, today, we recognize people as graphic designers, interior designers, as arts professionals. Um, and so that's sort of changed over time. Um, and, the, and the women who were in this founding generation of the club can really be credited with bringing together the very first official meeting of the organization in 1880. Uh, this is a great little clipping from the Providence Journal uh, writing about the, the first meeting of the art club. And I'll read it for you. It says, the Providence Art Club held its first general meeting last evening at the studio in the Wayland building by invitation of the ladies who gather there to pursue the study of art. The response to the invitation was so general and enthusiastic that there could be no doubt as to the interest felt in this movement. The harmonious impulses which brought the company together seemed in unison, with the soft light of the multitude of waxen tapers that illuminated the scene, the fragrance of flowers and the presence of the fair hostesses themselves lent a charm to the auspicious opening, which will be long remembered. An address by the art club president, Mr. Lincoln, was followed by the reading of the constitution and during the recess allowed for signing for membership. The list speedily mounted to more than 100 names. The art club accordingly may now be considered as successfully inaugurated, and we shall hopefully await the results of this association. Um, so that is in February of 1880. And you can, I think just in this very small newspaper article, you can see how desperately a city like Providence needed an arts organization like this, because at their very first meeting, 100 people quickly signed up to take part. And just five years later, we moved into the clubhouse on Thomas Street where we're still located today. Um, and, and, and they saw their membership sort of explode kind of immediately. Um, you know, just to put ourselves in the mindset of people in 1880, you know, this is only really, I mean, it's 15 years after the end of the American Civil War, which was, uh, you know, obviously this enormous carnage for families all over the United States. Um, and at this point in American history, we really didn't have anything that you would consider an art culture of our own. Um, if you were if you were going to be a visual artist, you basically would go to Europe to to study. Um, just three years before the Providence Art Club is founded, the Rhode Island School of Design is founded, um, which obviously today is one of the leading art schools in the country. Um, but 
but prior to that, there really were very few professional art schools in America. Um, you had Yale had their own art school. You had the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, but really nothing else to speak of. And, and right around the same time, the Metropolitan Museum is being founded. The Museum of Fine Arts Boston is being founded. So this is during this you know, surging moment of visual art culture in the United States. Um, this is the log where they began signing up. Um, members very quickly. So you see that February 19th, 1880 is the first um, six, uh, 16 people signing up. Um, probably most notably, or one of the most notable early members that we had is the second name that you see there on the list, E.M. Bannister. And some of you may recognize that name. Um, Edward Mitchell Bannister was an important African-American landscape painter. Um, his paintings can be found in many, many museum collections. The Smithsonian has a number of his paintings. So in your neighborhood, uh, you can go and see works by Edward Mitchell Bannister. And he was really, along with these six women who helped lead that first meeting, he was really one of the founding elements of the Providence Art Club, which is you know, quite extraordinary. And I'll talk a little bit more about Mr. Bannister in a minute. Um, this is the, and you have to love the beautiful script, the way these things are written. This is the constitution of the Providence Art Club. Um, and just a few snippets out of it that might be of interest are, you know, in, in the second article here, um, they say that their main goal is going to be to hold at least two exhibitions annually. Um, today we host three new exhibitions every three weeks. So I think that we have well exceeded the, uh, what our founders anticipated for us in 1880. Um, and then in the, in the sort of second section there, uh, they talk about combining social interests with those of art, that they don't just want to be a static art gallery or art museum, that they want to be a place that activates the interest in art and brings together collectors, art lovers, art educators, and creates an organization that really in their own time was entirely new. There really wasn't anything like this around and they and they forged something that was really quite novel. And we continue even today to act on a lot of these impulses that they had. We have galleries at the art club. We have um, dining and social programs at the art club. We have education programs at the art club. And then we house artist studios where people make work uh, quite regularly. Um, because we have you know, a number of extraordinary people who were involved in the art club through our history, I'm just gonna highlight two people who I thought might be of most interest to you. The first is Rosa Peckham. Um, Rosa Peckham was a portraitist, um, a, a very well-trained portraitist who had traveled um, to Europe quite extensively before she uh, moved back to Providence. Um, and she was the first secretary of the club. The documents that I showed you a minute ago were all written in Rosa's hand. And in 1882, she was actually offered the presidency of the art club, um, you know, almost 40 years before the right to vote was recognized for women in America. Um, and she uh, turned it down because at that time in 1882, being the president of the art club was basically like being the executive director. Rosa was a smart woman. And she said, no, thank you. I will continue to be, uh, they made her like an honorary vice president at the time. Um, so she was a remarkable woman. She, she traveled to Paris. She studied extensively there and she made um, portraits. And for that reason, they sought her out in the founding of the Providence Art Club because she was one of the few artists in Providence at the time who had that kind of international sort of experience. Um, <clears throat> a few years ago in 2017 at the Art Club, we put together an exhibition about our women founders because we were just beginning to realize how really extraordinary that was and how few organizations could make a claim to that sort of establishment. Um, on the 30th anniversary of Women's History Month, we put together this really exciting exhibition about these women. Um, and in the course of doing that, Rosa Peckham's family uh, actually still has a number of letters of hers, some of her original work and, and stuff like that. And they lent us some of these items so that we could sort of explore them. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And in one of the letters uh, that they gave us, we were sort of reading through this letter um, to find like a pull quote for our catalog and for the exhibition. And it was a letter home from when she was in Paris studying. Um, when she was in Paris, she lived with May Alcott, the sister of Louisa May Alcott, 
of you know Little Women fame. Um, and May Alcott ran in all of these wonderful expatriate circles. So Rosa Peckham, you know, had an audience with Mary Cassatt, for instance. They went and they went to Mary Cassatt's house and they had lunch there. And like in the first page of this multi-page letter, we saw Mary Cassatt's name mentioned. We were just, oh, we were so ecstatic. We said, this is the quote we've been looking for. She's going to talk about how Mary Cassatt inspired her or something. Um, and she said, you know, writing home, she said, the food at Mary Cassatt's house is just dreadful. Mary Cassatt needs to find a new cook. So we said, well, okay, well, that's not really the quote we want to use. Let's see if there's anything else in here. You know, she wasn't really a fan of Mary Cassatt's house. Um, and on the second page of this letter home, she writes about her experience studying anatomy and, and studying in the studio where she was. And there's this really beautiful quote that we pulled out of it. Um, and it's in this line here. She says, I am nearing slowly and steadily the goal that I have set for myself, namely to be number one in the studio. And she underlines number one there. You can see it on the right hand side. Um, you know, one of the ways that sort of professional art historian type people uh, exclude women artists from the history of art is to say that they weren't quote unquote serious, you know, that if you were a woman artist, you pursued, uh, you know, domestic scenes, or you did sort of watercolor things, or you, you know, you didn't do things that were serious. Um, and in her own words, someone like Rosa Peckham, you know, speaking while she's studying in Paris at an atelier, um, you know, says, I am serious, you know, she speak, you know, she's sort of speaking to us, um, you know, through this letter. And it was very, another one of those sort of like chilling moments as you're reading this it was really um, sort of fascinating and, and exciting for us. And, and so we wanted to celebrate Rosa in that exhibition. Um, this is an example of one of Rosa's, pe one of Rosa's paintings, um, probably from the 1870s. Um, <clears throat> it's of a girl in Breton headdress. Um, it's now in the collection of the art club. Before we did this exhibition in 2017, we had no artwork by Rosa in our collection. And after that show, we were able to add five pieces by Rosa to our collection. So now we have a very nice showing of her, of her portrait work. Um, this painting is quite typical of its period. Um, you know, she traveled to France and in France, she was looking at the sort of local characters and she was using local models in her work Likely they had a young French girl modeling for the class and they dressed the girl up in Breton costume so that the class could sort of, you know, explore what that was like. And in it, you get these great pieces of translucent fabric. You have this very subtle coloration of the cheek, you know, the capturing of the way the, the light falls from the studio window across the face of this young woman. And then the very subtle coloration of the background, just a beautiful, very subtle um, portrait. Um, and we have a number of other pieces by Rosa as well. <clears throat> the other art club member that I would draw your attention to from this founding generation is Edward Mitchell Bannister. Um, he was a very prominent landscapist. He was, like I said, the second person to sign on to the constitution of the art club. And he was one of the, you know, one of the first in a, in a new generation of African-American artists who made their mark on American art history. Um, Edward Bannister was born a free black man in Nova Scotia in Canada. <clears throat> and then he traveled to first to Boston and then he lived in New York for a time. In New York, he found a profession as a, um, as a photo colorist. He would color tintypes basically. Um, and but even between Boston and New York, he experienced the kind of um, bigotry that made it almost impossible for a black man to gain um, a foothold in a studio or to train as an artist. It was really when he moved to Providence that he found a home for himself um, and for his wife. His wife's name was Christiana Bannister, and she herself was a remarkable person. She had a series of uh, hair salons. She made hair product for African-American women and together, uh, and she was actually in many ways, the more successful of the couple, you know, she became this incredible businesswoman and they opened a house for aged um, African-American people in Providence. Um, and he made a name for himself as an artist. Um, and it's in Providence, he was living in Providence in 1876 when he participated in the Philadelphia International Exposition. 
Um, and that was really one of the first times that he came to really national prominence as an artist. Um, this is an example of his work from 1899. Um, 1876, he exhibits a similar landscape painting in the tonalist style at the Philadelphia Exposition. Um, you know, the Philadelphia Exposition was the first World's Fair really to be held in the United States. Um, probably best known now, I suppose, artistically anyway, for being the first place where the Statue of Liberty was presented to Americans um, by um, Frederick Bartholdi, the sculptor. Um, you know, they presented this as sort of a signature moment at the Philadelphia Exposition. Um, you know, and that was just before New Yorkers sort of ungraciously said they didn't want the Statue of Liberty. You know, they didn't want to have to pay for it. Um, but also going on there, there was a massive, you know, national exhibition, and Edward Bannister submitted a piece to that called Under the Oaks. Um, the painting that he submitted to the show is now lost. Um, and hopefully maybe someday will be found, who knows. Um, but at that exhibition, he won a prize for it. And one of the sort of remarkable stories from Bannister's life is that he wins this prize at the Philadelphia Exposition. Um, he had entered the piece without putting his name on it. He entered it anonymously. And he heard from a friend that his painting had won a prize. So he went into the judge's room and he went up to the judge's table. And he said, um, I've heard you know, that uh, the painting number 54 won a prize, is this true? And he, in his own recounting to his friend, George Whitaker, he said that the judge, um, you know, this man of color walks into the room, an African-American gentleman walks up and asks about this painting. And the judge was entirely dismissive of him. He said the judge was extremely rude. And the judge said, why, like, what business is it of yours to know whether that painting won a prize or not? And Bannister very quickly sort of retorted, well, it's my painting, so I'd like to know if it won a prize or not. And the judge, and, and the judge sort of, you know, corrected himself. And Bannister says very pithily um, in this recounting to his friend, George Whitaker, another artist in Providence, he said, all of a sudden, it was like a bomb exploded in the room. The expressions on the people's faces changed and they all started bowing and scraping to me. Um, so it's this sort of um, at once a very, you know, sad meditation on what he experienced as a black man in America, but also, you know, this moment of like great triumph, which would be, you know, it's like a cinematic moment of achievement. It's really exciting. Um, this painting, The Old Home from 1899 is in the collection of the Providence Art Club. It is really a fantastic example of Edward Mitchell Bannister's painting. He was an artist who was really deeply inspired by um, the French tonalist painters of the Barbizon school. Uh, if you think of Camille Corot, for instance. Um, and then he took the, the sort of prototype of French painting and combined it with elements that were uniquely American and he made a uniquely American form of landscape painting. Um, and that's why you'll find Bannister paintings in all kinds of museum collections. Uh, just two or three years ago, um, a really lovely pastoral scene by Bannister sold, I believe for about $75,000 at Swan Gallery in New York. And, um, and it went into the collection of, I think it went to the Brooklyn Museum. So you see, you know, that's what his market is like recently. There's a lot of great resources out there to learn about Bannister. He's a, a remarkable person. And just recently we commissioned a, uh, one of our members commissioned for us a beautiful bronze bust of Bannister that we have on view with the club now. Um, and then we have photos of it on our website. I didn't have time to grab a shot of it for this, but um, if you go to our website, you can see an image of it. Um, in terms of our buildings, um, like I said, we moved into this building, our clubhouse in 1885. Um, this is an image of it probably from uh, before 1917. Um, you can see that, uh, that it has this great sort of brick facade. Another sort of claim to fame that we think we have anyway is that this is probably the first brick veneer house of its kind on the East Coast anywhere. Uh, it was built in the 1780s. And when we moved into it in 1885, it was essentially a rooming house. Um, and uh, there's some indication that it may have been like a, like a brothel of some kind, you know, but that isn't that what they always say about old houses like this. Um, when they moved in, they gutted the top two floors of it. They added that enormous skylight on top and they created a very suitable gallery for themselves. And we still use the same gallery today. So it, again, it's this exciting sort of connection back to history. Um, the building that you see on the left-hand side there with the lovely uh, little storefront underneath uh, is the Cyril Dodge house. Uh, Cyril Dodge was a silversmith who brought the jewelry industry to Providence, basically. And the jewelry industry is what made Providence famous, essentially. Um, Cyril Dodge and his brother invented the technology that allowed gold to be alloyed to a, a sort of underlying material 
for the jewelry industry, basically. Um, and so that was his house. In 1908, the house was jacked up a story. And so that storefront was added later underneath. Um, the original uh, 18th century par parlors are still on the second floor of that house. Um, in 1917, we purchased that building and we connected these two buildings together with a bridge that you could see in that earlier photo. So that's how we know this is prior to that date. It's probably from around um, 1910 or something like that. And there's a little grocery store in the window um, down there, which is sort of fun. If you look closely, you can see the canned goods sort of piled up in the window. Um, another one of our remarkable buildings is the Fleur de Lis Studio, which was built in 1885 by the artist Sidney Burley and the architect Edmund Wilson as a collaboration together. Um, Sidney did a lot of the designing of the uh, decorative elements and Edmund, I think, put together the engineering that made this building possible. Um, when people see it now, I think people see sort of shades of Tudor uh, architecture. Um, you know, it's sort of a mishmash of all, it's a pastiche of different things going on here. But what really makes this building important is that it's indicative of the emergence of the arts and crafts style in the United States. Um, Sidney Burley was not a founding member of the art club. He was traveling in Europe when the art club was founded. And I believe he came back around 1882, 1883. Um, and when he came back, he quickly joined the art club and he became um, a really important member. He's like, you know, he's really considered one of the one of the major artists of the Providence Art Club. He was also a furniture maker. He was a real Renaissance man. He was an, an, a remarkable person. Um, and in this building, he sought to express the values of the arts and crafts movement, which he had found in Europe. Um, so across the surface of the front here, you have this great plaster work. You can see the date 1885 and one of the little roundels over the front door on the, on the sort of left-hand side. Um, across the top, just under the eaves, you can see the three muses of art that he included there. And then you get these great um, multi-pane windows. Um, it's, it's an extraordinary building. If you're ever in Providence, I would encourage you to come visit us. I'm happy to show you the interior. Um, it really is a landmark, landmark building. Um, and it really, and in Providence is one of the best known buildings. We constantly are, you know, on Instagram, people are always like tagging us in this building and, and stuff. Um, and, and it's a remarkable place. Uh, and today we have five artists who have studios in that building. They're all members of the club. We charge them a uh, below market rate rent and we charge just enough so that we can maintain the building. Um, Burley's wife gave the building to the club in the late 1930s. And in the deed, it's written that we must maintain it as artist studios in perpetuity. And we've, and we've honored that since we've had that building, um, but really a landmark of arts and crafts in America. Um, and such a landmark that in 1899, American Architect and Building News did this remarkable photo spread of the interior. You know, you think of like Architectural Digest or something, you have this, this great photo spread. Um, the interior is essentially unchanged. Uh, the interior of the large studio, which you see in the sort of upper photo there with the griffins painted over the fireplace, this remarkably sort of romantic interior um, is basically identical to what it looks like there. Uh, and there's one lucky artist named, his name's Anthony Tomaselli, who gets to use that studio. Um, and he really, he loves to hold court there and he, and he opens it to the public quite regularly. Um, but it really is just a remarkable, remarkable space. And I think if you, if you're familiar with the arts and crafts movement, I think looking at these images, you can get a sense for how this connects back to the arts and crafts movement in America. Um, around the around the fireplace there, there's some remarkable Dutch tiles that Sydney brought back from Europe. Um, he has his griffins there. On the left, you'll see like a balcony space. He would have had seating up there. Um, it's almost like when you're in the space, it's almost like a pulpit or something. Like I'm sure that he would have sort of stood up there and, and shared stories with his friends and stuff. And then right around the fireplace, there's also a lovely little angle nook bench. And you know, it's very much of that moment. Um, you know, you think, Someone like Sidney Burley was bringing this back, and in just a couple generations, you know, the arts and crafts movement would inspire, you know, the American bungalow. It would inspire uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. You know, it would inspire all these different sort of iterations. And it all started with Americans going to Europe and then, you know, transmuting that to a, a, an American experience. Um, you know, so some of the activities that we take part in. I mentioned exhibitions, you know, from the very beginning, one of the goals was exhibiting, you know, the, the founders said, we're, we're going to exhibit 
twice a year. And like I said, now we, we have one of the most rigorous exhibition schedules that I've ever heard of anywhere. Um, and so I think we're doing them proud. This is our main gallery as it looked in 1901. Um, you can see they had this lovely uh, plaster frieze around the top of the room. In this image, it's sort of overlaid with garlands that mimic the garlands that are in the plaster frieze itself. You know, it's quite, to, to, I think to modern eyes, it's a little bit busy. It's sort of, it's sort of an interesting image. Um, and, they, and they have the space just filled, filled with material. This was um, the 1901 Arts and Crafts show that they did. Uh, one of the first really major surveys of the arts and crafts movement as a contemporary art movement. Um, you can see that they have some illustrations um, tacked up on the wall. They have works of ceramic, they have works of furniture design, they have uh, you know, tapestries and works of fabric. You know, they were really taking a wholesale sort of view of what arts and crafts could be and, and doing this first major exhibition of it, which is quite exciting. Um, we renovated this gallery in 2017. And when we did, we were sort of taking out a portion of the wall and underneath the original baseboard was still uh, tucked back behind some plywood that had been laid over it. And it was painted this bright, bright red. And there was this um, sort of muslin fabric over the top of it that was like a dark brown. And so that gives you a sense of the sort of warm tones that would have been in this in this space. You know, today we think of the gallery as like the, you know, the perfect pristine white or beige cube, you know, the perfect neutral background for artwork. And they didn't think of it that way. They thought of it as a warm, you know, all encompassing sort of space. And when I, when I talk about these old images of the art club, I often like to joke about the New England frugality, you know, New Englanders will literally never throw anything away. Um, the little table that you see, the check-in table that you see at the, in the sort of mid lower left of the image with the kind of spindle legs there, we still have that table today and we still use it. So we never get tired of things. Um, this is another view of our main gallery from the 1890s. Um, and just another great period picture of what of how people hung things back then. You know, this is truly salon style hanging up over the over the plaster frieze there. And they have this lovely lighting system. They have a lovely chandelier. You can see the natural light coming in from that monitor skylight they had. Um, sometime in the 1970s, they took the skylight out, unfortunately. And maybe someday if we win the lottery, we'll put it back. But the space is still uh, remarkably, remarkably beautiful. Uh, not long after this photo was taken, they were, had already outgrown this space. And the back wall that you see with the large portrait of the man in the middle, uh, they knocked that wall through and they added a library on, on the back side of this space, which I'll show you a little bit later. Um, as another comment on Yankee frugality, the, the long bench that you see in the middle of the image, we still have that bench and we still use it in the gallery. So we are deeply connected to this history. Um, this is just another view of that same gallery space to give you a sense of the kind of continuity here. Uh, the, the top image is from a 1955 memorial exhibition of the sculptor Florence Brevoort Kane, who was a, she was a remarkable woman who studied in France. Uh, she studied in Paris and was known as the Rosa Bonheur of her studio because she was so good at depicting animals. You can see in this image, there's a few of her horse sculptures in there. Um, and when she died in 1955, she left a remarkable and a remarkable um, inheritance to the club. She left us $150,000, something like that in cash. And then she also left us her house, uh, which was a, this huge house in Narragansett, which is sort of a beach community in Rhode Island. Um, and uh, we quickly sold the house and then put all the money together and established the club's endowment. So she's a, a remarkable uh, person in the club's history. Um, and then the lower images from 2017, just after we did a major renovation of this space, we, we sort of restored the walls and we put all new lights in and we did some wonderful things um, in that room. You can see that most of the plaster frieze was taken out like in the 1960s, um, but in the four corners of the room, we still have four pieces of it. And, and it's a lovely detail. It's really, really quite nice. Um, and then in the, in the lower right-hand side of this image, you can see our uh, much loved Steinway piano, which we bought brand new out of the catalog in the 1890s. Um, and it is still in beautiful working order. When we restored the this gallery, we had the Steinway restored as well. Um, and we still use it. It's a fantastic instrument. And whenever we have a pianist come to play it, they're always like, you know, just blown away by this, by this piece. Um, 
you know, the members from the very, very beginning have really led the organization. You know, we are very much a member led club. Um, this is an image of one of our installs of us installing one of our shows. Um, and these are members, uh, the two women in front are members who are hanging. And then the younger woman in the back here is one of my gallery staff who's helping. Uh, but you notice she's staying far, far away. You know, we try to just help in the sort of background for, for the most part. Um, and, and it really, you know, I think again, continues that continuity uh, with our founders. You know, they really wanted to, to be involved. Uh, the art club did not have a full-time gallery director until uh, our first gallery director was in the 1960s, but she really wasn't full-time. Um, we really didn't have a full-time gallery director until sometime in the 1990s. Um, and even though we've been around for 140 years, I'm only the like the 13th gallery director that the club has had because it was so member run for so much of its history. Uh, and it's sort of a fun element of, of who we are. Um, over the years, we've more of those responsibilities been taken on by professional staff. These are uh, my two gallery assistants, Abba and Bree. Um, and we also have a general manager who runs the entire club. We have a, an executive chef now, a dining room manager. So we're a, fi a far cry from 1880 when poor Rosa Peckham was, you know, had, had wanted nothing to do with being president of the club because she didn't want to have to do all the work. Now professional staff take care of most things and, uh, and the members get to enjoy the club and, and uh, get to take part in, in exhibitions and classes and stuff. Um, you know, camaraderie was a central element of what the founders were interested in, in doing. They wanted to bring together artists um, in terms of showing artists work. They wanted to have artists talking about art. They wanted to have lectures. They wanted to do all kinds of different things. Um, and that's something we continue today. This is just a fantastic image, um, again, probably from the 1890s, of our women and men founders together. Um, the gentleman down at the, at the front right there holding the beer stein up over his nose. That's Sidney Burley who built the, the Fleur de Lis building. Um, and you can see that they're sort of acting out here a kind of Dutch tavern scene, sort of, it's sort of funny. Um, and, and, and they just are having, having a, a good old time apparently. Uh, the room that they're in is called the cabaret room and we still use that space. It's again, another one of these continuity moments. Um, we still use that space as a private dining room. Um, and we call it the cabaret room because apparently at some point in the club's history, the gentlemen of the club would hire ladies to come and dance in that room, which who knows if that's true or not, but apparently that's how the name came along. Um, and, and today it's, we're a little less body, I think, than these, than these folks were. Um, this is the club's green room. Um, again, probably from about 1890. This is in the interior of our clubhouse. Um, the space that was totally, you know, it was a, an 18th century home that they gutted when they moved in in 1885 and completely rebuilt the interior to suit their needs. Um, this irregular sort of paneling here that you see, uh, that's all the colonial window shutters that would have been on the inside of the windows. They ripped them all out and they refashioned them into this lovely paneling. Um, you see all their beer steins lined up around the, around the uh, trim there. Um, you see the, the silhouettes, which we've become somewhat known for over the years, which I can talk a little more about. Um, and, and this was really the, the key social room of the club originally was the, was the green room. We still use this room today pretty much the same way. Um, people usually will sort of sit in there before lunch or we'll have evening programs in there. Um, it's a really fun clubby sort of space. And this is how it looks today, basically the same as it did back then. Maybe a few less beer steins, but you get the, the sense of these lovely silhouettes. Um, primarily the, the first silhouettes were all men. Um, and my understanding of them is that uh, the men had these, they would have these gatherings called Friday nights where they would get together on Fridays and they would drink beer and they would get in line and they would drink a keg of Narragansett ale until it was empty. And then they'd put in another one and they'd all get back in line again and start over. So it was sort of, um, you know, they liked to party. They had a, they had a good time. Um, and then the men who were at these parties typically would, uh, you know, they would be the ones who would get silhouettes on the wall. Um, so the, the one closest to us on the left that says St. Benedict on the sort of edge of it, that's Sidney Burley. Uh, the one farthest to the right with the number one over it, that's Edward Bannister is the first person to get a silhouette. Um, also notably in this image, you can see it sort of just in from the right there is a Gustav Stickley bookcase. Um, we have a number of Stickley pieces that were all bought brand new out of like the first Stickley catalog, which is like, you know, quite interesting. They loved, they loved the arts and crafts movement. They were really, really into it. 
Um, and this is just a close up of Edward Bannister's silhouette. You'll notice he has a number one over his forehead there and a little palette over his head. And Bannister was so beloved by all of his fellow early members and so recognized for being like one of the leading forces behind the art club that he received the first silhouette. That's why there's a number one over it to denote him as the, as the sort of leader. And when Bannister died at the turn of the century, um, many of his fellow art club members got together to pay for uh, a really fabulous headstone for him that has like an artist palette engraved on it. And it's this remarkable thing. If you look it up, you can find images of it online. It's a remarkable, a remarkable testament to him. And, and so is the silhouette. Um, as part of that sort of camaraderie, the cafe is a big part of the club. Um, this is one image of a of part of our cafe, which this space dates to the 1890s. Um, you can see those silhouettes continuing around the room, um, this great woodwork, this paneling and uh, all the plaster work. Uh, it is a remarkably charming space. It, it really is. I mean, we are so in a way spoiled because we are there all the time. And whenever I bring people through the club uh, to see it in person, they're always sort of blown away by this remarkable sort of, you know, stuck in time, you know, 19th century experience it really is quite remarkable. Um, the, the tiles that you see set into the walls are Turkish tiles. Um, they date from about the 13th century to the 19th century. One of them is extraordinarily valuable, apparently, and I always forget which one it is, but um, but there was some antique dealer who was there for lunch one day years ago and saw it and said, you know, that is a really significant piece of, of decorative art. But of course, now it is, you know, for all eternity stuck in the wall of the art club. Um, and then you can see the great, you know, the silhouettes are sort of funny. You have two in the back there on either side of the window. One is smoking a a cigar and the other one is lighting his pipe. Um, again, you know, the silhouettes were primarily a sort of boys club for some part of the club's history. Um, but now many of our women members also have silhouettes. Um, this is another comparison just to show you again that that's very interesting continuity that we experience as people who are interested in art history, you know, and the same is true of your club, I'm sure, you know, you can look back and you can see these sort of interesting connections that you have with your historical counterparts. Uh, the image on the left is, again, from the 1890s, a gentleman in evening dress standing by the fireplace uh, in the cafe. And on the right, what it looks like now, you know, the, the room basically looks the same. And I always say the dress code has changed slightly. We're not as, we don't typically do uh, tuxedo and tails when we're, when we're there for dinner, but, um, but it would be kind of fun to do, a, to do something radically formal like that. Um, this is just one image of one of the very artful um, desserts that our pastry chef, Julia, puts together. Um, you know, just to give a sense of, you know, what the culinary side of the club is like. Um, again, if you're ever in Providence um, and you're a member of the Arts Club of Washington, you'd be very welcome to come and, and dine at the Art Club, and I hope you do. Um, the library, I mentioned earlier that they added a library on in the 1890s. This is an early view of that. Um, you can see already, again, this is not even 20 years after the club is founded. They've already added this library on. They, they're collecting prints. You can see like Franz Hall or Rembrandt there over the doorway. They're collecting original paintings. They're collecting sculpture. They're collecting plaster casts. You know, they're already collecting all these things. Um, on the left-hand side, there's a sort of a chair set against that doorway. That's a Sidney Burley chair. There's a Sidney Burley chest in this image. He also made furniture. You can see some of that there. You know, the members are really interested in collecting already. Um, this space still exists today in a, in a sort of different format. This is that same space as it looks now. Um, in, in around 2009, they converted this space to a bar and they moved the library to a different part of the building. But you get a sense of the of the sort of atmosphere in that space. Again, it's it's sort of one of those spaces where you, um, you know, we spend so much time in it that we sort of lose the appreciation of it. And, and But it really is a remarkable, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful room. Um, and we typically hang pieces around permanent collection in that space. You can see some selections of that here. Um, the painting over the fireplace is a George Bars. Uh, you may be familiar with him. He did some of the um, mural work at the Library of Congress. Um, so you may be familiar with his work. Um, the coffee table that you see there, that is a Sidney Burley chest. Um, and over the, over the bar window is a piece that depicts the first 11 presidents of the art club. And they're all dressed up in tuxedos in an opera box. So again, there's this great sense of humor and fun and, and conviviality throughout all the things that they did. 
education has always been an important part of the club's history. Um, this is just a little look into one program that we did in uh, December of 1902. We, we welcomed John Lafarge. Um, and I love that it says on his card, John Lafarge of New York is going to come and give a lecture at the art club. Um, at 8.30 in the evening, he came, he gave a lecture probably about decorative arts or about uh, stained glass or about, you know, he was a real Renaissance man. One of the leading um, stained glass designers of his time. You know, he was definitely a competitor of Tiffany. Um, and locally in Rhode Island, we have this beautiful example of his work. Um, if you're familiar with Salve Regina University, which is located in Newport, um, in their chapel, they have three windows by Lafarge, which are like remarkable, like just beautiful, beautiful examples of his multi-layer opalescent, just jewel-like stained glass. So to think that a master of that craft like him was at the art club talking back then, you know, gives you a sense of how serious they were about, you know, the best in contemporary art of their time. Education today looked a little bit different than it did for our early members. Today we have this beautiful um, third floor studio that we added on in 2009. Um, and this is a view into one of our classes, a pastel class. Um, over the course of a year, we'll do about 70 classes and workshops. Um, in addition to this space, we also have a dedicated printmaking studio because printmaking has always been an important part of the club. Um, and the club is just in normal times, a beehive of activity. It's like, there's people there constantly. There's people there all day. You know, they're coming in and out of the gallery. They're going to class, they're going to lunch, they're going to programs. Um, so I think it really lives out the, the sort of goals that our founders uh, set for it. We also, this is a view into one of our gallery spaces. This is that storefront gallery that I was showing you, originally a butcher shop and meat market and grocery store. Um, and now this lovely sort of retail style gallery space. Um, and this is an artist, Teresa Girard, talking about a solo show she had with us a couple of years ago. The big glass windows there face into one of our dining rooms. Um, and in that room, we have a number of pieces from our permanent collection displayed. So you can come, you can go to lunch, you can be in the midst of the gallery and everything. And the nice thing about our gallery talks is that we always do them free and open to the public for all of our exhibitions. We just did one yesterday night. Uh, and now, of course, they're all on Zoom, but hopefully soon we'll be back in the gallery doing them. Um, so that is my, you know, the quickest overview that I can give you of 140 plus years of art club history. You know, this is our, you know, sprawling little campus on the east side of Providence. Um, I do hope that if you're, uh, certainly if you're a member of the Arts Club, you have reciprocity with the, with the Providence Art Club. Next time you're in Rhode Island, I hope you will come and visit us and utilize your reciprocity with us. Um, in the meantime, you can join us on social media. Um, we are very active on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all those places. And if you have any questions about the club, um, you're very welcome to ask them during the Q&A that we're about to take part in. But if you're you know, too shy to do that, you're very welcome to email me or call me and I'd be happy to talk more with you about about the club. So uh, I'm happy to take questions now and, and talk more. Well, thank you, Michael. We really appreciate uh, your spending time with us this evening and uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating history of the Providence Art Club. Uh, obviously, we have a lot to live up to our, our founding <laughs> institution, the Providence Art Club. And it is kind of funny how um, sometimes we, we lose sight of our history, but uh, when when uh, Michael uh, approached us about doing a joint program and, and I went back into the archives and there just popped out that uh, our founding members had basically looked to the Providence Art Club to to start our our tradition, particularly the tradition of allowing women alongside men as as equal members of the Arts Club of Washington. So kudos to to your club for getting that tradition started. Um, as Michael said, if you have any questions, uh, put them in, into the chat. And uh, Sasha, I think you're, you're helping me to monitor those questions. I have a couple of questions down here already. So why don't I get, get the uh, program started off? Michael, I'm curious about Providence as sort of the incubator for such a progressive club. And what do you think? Is there something unique about Providence? You have a woman as co-equal members with men. You have an African-American as a member of the, of the club from the get-go. Uh, any thoughts on, on why Providence was sort of the beginning of this very progressive uh, art club movement? 
That's a fantastic question. Um, when I when I do these presentations about the art club, that is almost always the very first question: is why? <laughs> you know, why? How did this happen in Providence of all places? That's so strange. Um, I think part of it is. Providence at the time in 1880 was called the beehive of industry. Um, at the end of the 19th century, it was one of the richest cities in the United States. Um, they did have a lot of money and they had access to places like Boston and New York, but they were also a small city essentially. And, and so they needed, you know, they couldn't really afford to break people out into different groups, I don't think. I think they had to have everyone in one club to make this happen. And then the other thing is, you know, just three years before the art club is founded, just across the street from us basically is the Rhode Island School of Design and they were founded basically entirely by women. So I think we also had that to look at, which was nice because those women went to the Philadelphia Exposition. They raised a bunch of money to have a women's pavilion there for, for women um, involved in different industries and they had money left over from it. And when they came back to Providence, they had something, I think it was a little over a thousand dollars and they were trying to decide what to do with it. And one of them said, let's found an art school. And, and, and that's where that came from. And so the art club had that to look up to as well. So it was a, it was a unique place um, in that sense, but it, it is interesting. You know, you wouldn't think of a, a small place like Providence as being the incubator for something so sort of revolutionary in some ways. Yeah, one of the things I noticed about our founding members is that they were associated with some of the local uh, art institutions. And in D.C., we had the Corcoran mm -hmm. Art Gallery, which was founded in the late 1870s. But then they had the, uh, the Corcoran School of Art. And so our artists were trained in that school and then they taught in the faculty. So there was that, that nexus there. Um, in D.C., it was kind of a vibrant place for art because you had the government and the government was hiring people to, to develop some of the, uh, the great public spaces. And I think less so of, of Providence, but it sounds like Providence did have a very active, maybe art patron culture, sounds like, with all, with all were, the money that was there. Yeah, they were beginning to develop it. And the nice thing about a city like Providence is being equidistant between, you know, Boston and New York, they could readily travel between these places. And the other thing is that, you know, in the 19th century, something maybe we take for granted a little bit is that in the 19th century, the rail network was so excellent that they would go, you know, they would go to shows in Boston all the time. They would do shows in New York constantly. They would be in Philadelphia, in DC. You know, they had this Eastern seaboard sort of connection um, which was quite quite remarkable as well. Uh, another another question I was kind of curious about. As, I don't know whether you you described it or Henry did as not a clubhouse but a club block. <laughs> and I'm curious how how much square space do you occupy? It, it looks enormous. We have a lot of space. We have a lot of space, and it does go back beyond these buildings. It's not just the street. There's like a courtyard. And the other interesting thing is like. The street that you're looking at is called Thomas Street, and it had that alone has an interesting story. Um, whenever we tell people like we're on Thomas Street, no one in Providence knows where Thomas Street is. Uh, the street just up the hill beyond this is called Angel Street, which is like a long street that runs across the city. And when they were having the map of Providence engraved, they sent it. They sent the map to Boston, like a like the handmade map to Boston, to the engraver. And somewhere along the line, it was folded. This is at least the sort of apocryphal version of this story. And when it got to the engraver, Thomas, uh, the a name of the street was originally supposed to be Thomas Angel's Lane because each street belonged to a different property owner. Um, and so when it got to the engraver, it was sort of split and it said Thomas Angel. And so he made it into two streets. So that's why Thomas Street exists on its own. And we basically own like almost all the frontage on Thomas Street. It's like our street. Um, and and so it is sort of an interesting, an interesting thing. Sometimes occasionally, like I've seen our buildings here uh, used as like the header in travel and leisure. And they'll say like, these are houses on the east side. And I've written a few sort of letters to the editor saying, no, 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 no. That's the art club, not houses on the east side. You know, But it is a, it's a remarkable streetscape for sure. We had, uh, I think, two questions about the silhouettes that you had, I think it was in your grill room. Mm -hmm. And one question was, are you still collecting silhouettes? We do. We do indeed. So I can actually, I think I can go back on this. Um, and this image here, just under the skylight that you see there, all of those silhouettes are, many of them are living members or very recently passed on members. 
Um, and they are people who were instructors at the club. Um, many of them are instructors um, for the most part, or people who served on the board or were presidents of the club. Um, so it's a very proud tradition and keeps going. This photo is a little out of date. We've actually gone all the way onto the right-hand wall too. We're like halfway up the right-hand wall with the silhouettes now. So it continues. And another question about silhouettes is, um, does your chef ever make special desserts based on the silhouette patterns? Uh, we don't have, that is an excellent, excellent question. We don't have, uh, I don't think chef has ever used the silhouette, but there's actually, a, there's actually, um, the art club is a club of people who I think since 1880 have just loved drinking. Like drinking is a big part of the culture there for some, whatever reason. And uh, there is a cocktail called the silhouette. And that is, and we actually have like the original recipe for it, like, uh, and, and so that's something. So not necessarily food, but a drink. <laughs> uh, the person corrected me and said that chocolate was an essential part of that question. So I guess it was a chocolate oh, okay. dessert. <laughs> I will tell our chef that. That's a good idea. I like that. Okay. And then another question, um, how many members do you have? And what is the kind of a rough breakdown between artist members and lay members, as we would sure. call them? That's a great question. Um, so right now we are just a little over, I don't know the current exact number, but I would say we are just over 630, uh, a little over 630. Um, of those, about, I think right now, I think we're at exactly 250. It's either 250 or like 252 are exhibiting artist members. Those are people who can take advantage of exhibiting in the galleries. Um, and then the rest of them are a mix of what we call patron members. Those are people who are like doctors, lawyers, people who are interested in the arts and wanna take classes and stuff, but don't make art. And then we also have a second subset, which is called the arts professional. Those are people who can't exhibit in all of our shows. They can exhibit in like one or two shows a year usually. Um, and they are people who come from professions that are affiliated with the visual arts, like architecture, graphic design, um, interior decorating, you know, different things like that. So that's basically the breakdown. Um, and even for having so many members, many of them know each other. I mean, it, it really is a very, um, compa I mean, I don't know, it's Rhode Island, so everybody knows each other really, but, but it really is a very friendly place. Yeah, we do uh, monthly exhibits, but they're curated and it's it's um, artists who have to compete basically. So it isn't necessarily arts club members, although sometimes the arts club members do exhibit mm -hmm. as part of that curated uh, space. But are your exhibits uh, exclusive to arts club, art club of uh, Providence members or That's is it great more of a, well. a mixed uh, bag? Most of our, I would say like 90% of our exhibitions are art club members. Um, the way that our exhibitions work is quite, it really is, I mean, it's entirely unique, I think. Um, exhibiting artist members are eligible for a three or four person show every two years, and then they're eligible for a solo show in that big storefront gallery every five years. And basically, the way that it works out in terms of who's eligible and who's actually interested in showing and who's ready to show is that in a normal year, you know, before all the COVID disruptions and everything, in a normal year, I could almost guarantee that every artist who applied, I would be able to fit them in and give them their show. Um, this year, we're, we're still jostling the schedule for next year a little bit. Uh, but in the normal year, basically everyone will get a show. So as an exhibiting artist, you're essentially guaranteed a group show every two years and a solo show every five years. And then two times a year, we do big all member shows with prizes. And those usually have about 150 artists in them. Um, in December and November, we do our little picture show, which is the oldest and largest little picture show in the country. We'll show um, about 600 pieces at a time in that show and we'll sell about 500 each year. Um, this year we sold over 500 in, in about a month and a half. Um, and we've been doing that show since 1904. So mo almost all the shows are member-based, but they are they run the gamut of different styles of show. One of our artist members reminded me that we that the Arts Club of Washington does have two, uh, two members only exhibitions, one in the winter and one in the summer. Yeah. Um, Another question was um, whether or not you do joint uh, joint exhibitions with other uh, with other clubs, for example. Do you know as we were getting as we were getting ready for this today, I was talking to my coworker, 
And I said, you know, we're like, we're getting into this reciprocal lecture series thing, but that is definitely something that's going to be on my mind is some kind of reciprocal exhibition because just a couple of years ago, for the first time since I've been at the art club, we did a reciprocal exhibition with the St. Botolph Club of Boston. Um, I'm not sure if your club is reciprocal. Are you reciprocal with them? You may be. Um, and they're a lovely club. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're a lot of fun. And we did a reciprocal show with them where they did an exhibition of our members and we did an exhibition of their members. And that was a really fun um, reciprocal activity. At the time, I think we, we thought of it as sort of a traveling show, but then I, it was too much work. So we, we thought we'd take a break from it for a little while. Oh, we'll have to put you in touch with Gloria Benedetto. She's our exhibitions uh, chair. So it sounds like a wonderful idea though. Yeah. Um, Let's I have a, one that was sent to me in a private message I want to share with folks, if you don't mind, Martin. Um, for Michael, um, are you reciprocal yet with the Women's Club of Fort Worth, which has four buildings and a great arts program? Oh, that's a great. No, we are not reciprocal with them. Yeah, I would love to learn more about them. Um, if you'd like to email me information about them, I'd be happy to have it. The most recent reciprocity that we've added um, was with the Cliff Dwellers. If any of you are familiar with them in Chicago, I think we just added reciprocity with them last year or the year before last. Um, and we also have reciprocity with the Arts Club of Chicago, um, with the St. Botolph Club, the National Arts Club, Salma Gundy, the Arts Club of Washington. Uh, and then we have res reciprocity with uh, a couple organizations in London and in Italy. Um, but I would love to learn more about them, yes. Thanks, Sasha. And then here we have a question. Uh, do you have arrangements for overnight accommodations at the club as we do in Washington? That's a great question. Um, so one of the buildings, I can show you this, um, the yellow building here used to be leased by the Rhode Island School of Design for many years. They leased it for offices. And in like the late 90s, our club was getting it. They were taking the lease back so that we could use it. And at that time, they were like, should we use this for overnight should we make like a little B and B in that building or should we use it for artist studios? And we were a very artist like heavy club and they were like, no, like they, and so they made it artist studios right up the street from us is the, um, the hope club, which is another private club in Providence and they have overnight accommodation. And I'm not sure exactly how the, cause we have reciprocity with them and we often arrange for people to stay there. But Providence also has a lot of fabulous small hotels too. Cool. And somebody is saying Italy might be nice for us to have reciprocity with. <laughs> Could Michael share Italy reciprocal information with us? <laughs> I can definitely email it to you. The name of the club is the it's the Circolo uh, della, I forget the name of it, honestly. I don't know that, I don't know that any of our members have actually taken advantage of that reciprocity recently, um, mm -hmm. but I'd be happy to, if you send me an email, I'll find the name of it for you. And Michael, um, we, we talked a lot about uh, sort of painters and sculptors. Um, do, you, do you have artists in, in the other venues, sort of like literature, literary arts and the architecture, et cetera? Sure. Um, that's a fantastic question. That's something where that we right now are really looking at what does it mean to be an artist member, um, especially on the arts professional side of it, because that was the way that the founders sort of set it out. They said artist, arts professional, and then this other category, which originally was called non-artist. That was their original name for it. Um, Right now, the way it stands is that to be an artist member, you have to be a visual artist. Um, we accept work in any medium, basically, even things that would really be classified as like fine craft, like woodworking, jewelry, stuff like that. Um, we have a lot of photographers, abstract painters, sculptors, woodworkers, stuff like that. Um, but the other things like architecture, for instance, would be an arts professional. We recently had an application, our first one in a long time, for someone who wanted to be an arts professional and who was a professional uh, composer. And because we don't encounter that so much, that's something that we're still sort of ruminating on. But the determination, my understanding of what our membership committee has decided is that as long as a person makes their living doing that art, um, it doesn't really, I think that they're going to be a little more open to it on the arts professional side. And I believe the person who applied as a composer will be admitted as an arts professional because they make their living doing that art. Yeah, it's a little confusing. Yeah, well, I, I know when the Arts Club of Washington started, one of the ideas was they wanted to be very 
uh, cross-disciplinary. So we had the literary arts, we had the visual arts, we had mm-hmm. the plastic arts, we had uh, industrial arts, yeah. and et cetera. And then I think there's al- always been a little bit of a tension too between control, do the artist control? Uh, at what point do you have too much uh, tipping really basically where the late, late, portion has kind of overwhelmed the artistic portion and it sounds like you have kind of come up with a really nice way of monitoring that if you will by having these specialized categories yeah and I would say I mean it is interesting you know at there have been points in the art club's history even where you know there was a very strictly enforced you know um dress code that really precluded people from making art on the premises, essentially. Um, And now you'll like come into lunch and there'll be people in like jeans that are like splattered and paint there and stuff. And I remember not, I mean, I've been at the art club since 2014 and I can remember not long after I started, I was in the gallery with an artist and the artist was wearing, was wearing jeans. And uh, I think it was the president of the club who happened to be there, who was a very relaxed, was not, you know, was a very relaxed person, um, but was there. And this was sort of an old school sort of member. And when she was seen in her jeans, she apologized so profusely to the president of the club. And then after he left, she said that she was going to write him a letter to apologize for presenting herself in such a, an unseemly fashion in the gallery. And I, you know, as sort of a relatively new person to the organization was sort of, I didn't understand. I was confused. But now it's, even in the last few years, it's relaxed even more than that. Yeah, I would say that that's happened at the Odds Couple Washington. So it used to be jacket and tie for men. And now increasingly, it's a little bit more casual dress. Yeah. But I remember visiting the Savile Club in London. And there, it's a very, very strict dress code. Yeah. And I, I know that I was at the front desk checking into the club, and then one of the members knocked on the door, but he wasn't dressed appropriately, and he wouldn't come into the into the club. <laughs> and he was passing notes to the manager because he didn't want to violate the sanctity of the of the clubhouse by being dressed in uh, in jeans. It's an interesting. I mean, in some ways, I'm a somewhat formal person, so I do appreciate that. I stayed at a I stayed at a reciprocal club in New York City. Not long at, again, not long after I started at the art club, I was like, "Oh, I'm going to take advantage of this reciprocity," and I stayed there. And I arrived. You know, I got off the train. It was like midnight or something. It was quite late, and I was in jeans and a you know a shirt. And I and I walked in the door, and I was the only person staying there that night, so they knew who I was. And I was sort of familiar that they had a dress code. And I said, is the way I'm dressed okay? And they said, and they were not rude about it or anything. And they said, it's okay as long as you just stay on the stairs and, <laughs> and don't walk into the club at all. <laughs> right, right. You can be uh, not seen. <laughs> yeah, as long as you don't let anyone see you like that, it's okay. <laughs> right, right. Michael, it sounds like you have maybe a, a, an active program to collect your own either your past artists or your current artists work. Is, is that the case? We do, yeah. So we've been basically collecting since the very beginning. Right now, our collection stands at about 600 objects. Uh, we also have an extensive archive where we have scrapbooks going all the way back to 1880 as well. Um, and we collect pieces by individuals who are members of the club from 1880 to the present. Um, the chair of our collection, we're very fortunate, the chair of our collections committee is a former curator from the Newport Art Museum, so she's very expert and she's been fantastic. Um, and every year we have, I don't know that we really set aside a budget amount, but our collections committee every year will find money, maybe a member will donate money or whatever, and they'll find money to buy at least one painting a year typically by a, by a contemporary living member. And that's always a real, I think for people that's really exciting, they really love that, and then they get to be in the club, you know, for the rest of time, basically. Cool. That's a n- nice program. Well, Sasha, um, I know that we promised Michael we wouldn't we wouldn't keep him too long. It looks like we've gone 15 minutes uh, into our Q and A. Yes. Do you see any other questions, or or uh, do we want to uh, to let Michael? Uh, yeah, I think we got we captured all the questions in the chat. So you were pretty good at like um, I kind of went through and made sure we got everybody. Um, I would say if there's anybody um, last call, if there's a question someone asks live, you can unmute yourself and and um, ask Michael a question. So we'll give you a moment to see if anybody has another question. Kind of silent. 
Well, if that's the case, we, we're at the point in our program where, um, Michael, if you'd like to f stop sharing your screen, because I'd like to have everybody okay. come on and un and, un and um, basically turn your cameras on so we can see all your lovely faces, because I'd like to, you know, have everybody, you know, wave and say hello and wave goodbye. And, and we just want to say thank you, Michael, okay. for coming out and this is an amazing presentation i have got to get to that bar in providence it's absolutely <laughs> stunning and um thank you martin and thank you um henry since he had to leave us but you know he was you know a wonderful introduction but i like to get um, a, a big old shot of everybody waving because we like I, i'm starting this new tradition in our zoom hello hello, say hello. hello. Uh, we have, do we have a question from thomas mansby maybe hands back yes hands back uh uh, uh my uh, recommendation is, um, I, I mentioned in the chat, the Toronto Club of Arts and Letters. Uh, uh, I'm a member of the Cosmos Club. Uh, sadly, they did not go through our uh, committee, but it is an absolutely fabulous club that also has uh, uh, not only gallery space and so forth, but it also has working space on the top floor. Uh, and it's worth people looking into. As far as London is concerned, the, um, uh, the arts club on Dover Street uh, is not really any longer an arts club, but the one in, ah, uh, word is now. Uh, Chelsea. Chelsea. Thank you. The Chelsea Arts Club is an absolutely wonderful experience. Uh, strongly recommend it. And um, obviously everybody knows about the, uh, uh, the one uh, in New York on Gramercy Square, uh, which has Tiffany windows and all kinds of interesting places. But the, uh, uh, our reciprocal clubs are something that I would strongly recommend uh, that people take advantage of because uh, the great people, um, uh, many in many of them, the dining facilities are not only individual, but also communal with long picnic tables inside where you really do get to talk to people, uh, uh, sort of like uh, five or six club tables in a, um, uh, uh, in a large, large room with, uh, uh, for the most part, very good food. So there we are. And I'm sorry about Mary Cassatt. Uh, I will <laughs> pass that on to my friends. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, um, and, um, and well, I think that's it. So Martin, um, your yeah, last thoughts? Thanks. Thank you, Michael. We really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to uh, talking with, with your club on April 22nd. And I hope uh, folks here can, uh, can join us then as well. Thanks Thank again, you. everyone. Wave goodbye. Wave goodbye. We like to do the big wave. And I'll say if you want to um, learn more about us, we are at artsclubwashington.org. And thank you for coming out, and we'll see you at the next um, event. And like we say at the Arts Club, at least I say, it's a wrap, folks. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thanks so have all. a good night. Have a safe and, and pleasant weekend. Thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. We'll talk to you by email. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks, Michael.